Hello, welcome back to Voices of the Great War, and I'm Liz Watson. Today we're going to be reading our final letter from Edward Brown. Edward Brown is a soldier and he's stationed in France during World War I. And Edward, he writes most of his letters home to his brother William who lives in Maryland. And this is our final letter that we have from Edward and it is written on the American Army of Occupation in Germany. Stationary, you can see that also the YMCA. And the handwriting is very faded and um, it did take a little bit of effort trying to decipher a lot of what um, Edward's letter stated, but I, I think I did a pretty good job. I got most of it. Um, I was able to decipher most of it. So Edward's letter to his brother, and it's dated March 12th, 1919, and it reads, Dear Brother, Your long letter of February 18th and several papers arrived today, and I was glad indeed to have received them all. Our mail has been coming along dandy for the most part. Of course, there is still room for improvement, I am really sorry that I cannot send you some real good souvenirs. But the stores here have very little in stock, and what little they do have, they demand a fortune for. I am very glad you like the letter opener, though I seem to have been born with the habit of packing things carefully, or I have profited by our experiences. It was a great relief to know that you are enjoying good health again. There seems to have been so much sickness and epidemics during the past year that it is about time some precautionary measures are taken by the health department. The influenza epidemic seems to have plagued the most important parts and nationally has caused thousands of deaths. From what I have heard and read about it, the influenza is anything but pleasant. It seems stranger, though, that the majority of the cases are among the younger set. England, I understand, is experiencing it now. Again, referring to the mail and also answering your question. Thousands of letters have accumulated at various port towns, but as to why, I know not. The general explanation is that Postmaster Burleson is incapable of handling such an office. You can remember what efficient service we received at the hands of Postmaster Hitchcock. His predecessor, and at that time, postage was a good deal cheaper too. Burleson seems to be looking at the balance sheet too closely and not paying strict enough attention to the service. The mail seems, it is, uh, the mail is just not dependable now, it seems. I think he has also mixed his hands too freely and wishes to assume too much in the wealth of the telegraph, telephone, etc., don't you? I think the Republicans did a mighty wise thing in dropping General Pershing's name from the nomination. I am also willing to bet regardless of what political views the boys may have in the army, that if it were left up to the AEF, General Pershing wouldn't get one one hundred of their vote. He would be swayed absolutely. Just recently, a picture at the Y was shown for four successive days, showing him shaking hands with King George and then appearing by himself. I have yet to hear one yell or one person clapping or cheering him. In fact, you hear things just to the contrary. Now, don't take it for granted that this is my sole opinion, but only what I have observed and heard. Now, when our old faithful, the Rainbow's one and only General, General MacArthur, when those pictures appear, I am willing to say that you couldn't have heard more yelling and cheering than what came from the thousand throats. As you are aware, General Menor was relieved, then General MacArthur took charge, a man loved and respected by us. But General Pershing followed his own line again, appointing regular army as our commanding general. I have had the displeasure of seeing and the opportunity of observing General Flagler many times. The day he inspected us personally, he made sure, as he did all of the other boys dislike him by the foolish questions he asked. If I told you a few of them, you would laugh from now until next year. At one time, he sent a letter to many units throughout the division, holding up one of our officers and reprimanding him for riding in the front of a truck wearing a campaign hat. If General Flagler had the following and was loved as much as the officer he reprimanded, he might accomplish more. Yes, sir, our officer meal is dandy, honest as the day is long, a man whom you can place implicit confidence in and one who would stick by you until, until hell froze over. If possible, I want you to meet him when we come back. According to the latest information, unverified, we are to be re reviewed by General Pershing next Sunday. What follows all depends. 
No, I never did see President Wilson during his stay over here. In fact, I doubt if he ever made a trip into the Third Army territory. I guess you have received my letter that the post I received of Willem Settle's death was false. I had written his wife a letter of condolence, and when the letter from him arrived, I immediately replied to it. He seems to have had so much sickness in his family and has had considerable worry. I received a paper today and noticed considerable drilling is going on near Quinton. Now back to Settle. Yes, he had my place in charge, sold it for me, and wouldn't take a penny commission. Have had a statement from the bank where my money is now held. Well, Settle has been mighty good to me and honest. The only person I have ever heard say anything against him was that Birch, who was convicted lately by the court. His record, as you are aware, is a black one. This has been the prettiest day I've ever seen. I was on guard from four to eight last night and the same hours this morning. It was so warm I could hardly stand the blouse. The trees are rapidly blooming and several leaves are appearing. I enjoyed the touch of spring. Well, brother, I must close as it is getting late. With my sincerest regards, your brother, Ed. Edward H. Brown, 167th Infantry, 42nd Division, AEF. So um, Edward's letter, I think, was um, very interesting this time. Um, this is the first time I have actually written a letter where it really spoke um, a lot about maybe some um, doubt um, in officers, especially um, Pershing, you know, um, for the most part, um, you know, really most of the letters I've read really haven't gone into detail um, or haven't really discussed any of the boys' feelings regarding their commanding officers. And this is the first one that really went into um, detail about that. So um, from Edward's letter, we can, it's pretty easy to, to kind of get from his words and what he said that they didn't really, and, and it wasn't just his opinion, um, but that of a lot of other boys, they didn't really respect General Pershing and that they kind of viewed General MacArthur maybe as really their their leader. So General Pershing, and, and I can understand maybe where they were coming from. Um, if, um, if you look into General Pershing's methods, he um, believed in frontal attacks and he was using them well after a lot of the other um, allies stopped and they were using other methods of warfare other than these frontal attacks. So with the frontal attacks, you know, basically you go, you know, it's a front, you go over the top and you go towards the enemy in front of you and they can be very costly um, um, in lives. And it is believed by historians that General Pershing's method of using those frontal attacks really did cost um, a lot of American lives that maybe had he used different methods that that might not have happened. And another thing that General Pershing did where um, that a lot of people were pretty um, upset about and really didn't stand by what he did was we um, we knew that the armistice was happening on November 11th. It was it was known, you know, November 11th at 11 a.m. Final shot wars, you know, ceasefire. Even though this was known on November 11th, General Pershing, he didn't believe in the ceasefire. He, he wanted to continue on and, you know, basically squash Germany's military might so they could never, never do this again. Um, so he did not believe in that ceasefire. He wanted to continue fighting. And so on November 11th, even though he knew the ceasefire was approaching, um, in a few hours, he wanted his men to continue fighting. And total, there were 11,000 casualties on November 11th. 3,500 of those casualties were American, American boys. So a lot of people were not happy with that, um, and, and understandably so. I mean, we have the end of you know the ceasefires here. We know it's here. It's coming. It's imminent. Why are why why risk this? Why why? risk more American, why risk more lives, period, not just American lives, but why risk more lives, period. So, um, so I think maybe, and I'm sure part of that is, is probably a reason why Edward and the other boys 
did not feel, did not really support General Pershing and why they were maybe looking to um, General MacArthur as their leader. So um, yeah, I really did that when I wrote that letter out and read it, I, I was really um, kind of, it, it was very interesting to read that letter and kind of read um, Edward's thoughts on it. So now we're kind of to the show and tell portion of of our episode and I do have a couple things today. The first one I want to show you is actually now these, what I have here, and this is the case. I'll show you the case first. This is a case and what I have, it's a, it's a leather binocular case and you can see that at the very top we have a little compass there and it opens up of course and it's kind of like a wooden top here. So our binoculars are here and these binoculars they were actually these are actually the binoculars of a captured german officer and that german officer he was captured in saint michael in september september 17th 1918 and yeah they're in very good shape um you can actually see from the side very nice binoculars and you can they actually still work still work. These are our binoculars. I do wish I knew a little bit more behind the story, but um, so yes, the captured German officer's binoculars. And you can see if we spin, you see the, the eyepiece still adjusts there. And you can view your images from afar. And then the next thing I have, so this is actually, again, I'll show you the case first. So um, I have this case here for our compass and you can see it's actually, if I hold it up there, you can see it's engraved or he's kind of etched um, his name as well as his unit. So we see it says A. McAllen, 60th Aero Squadron, USA. Here is the actual compass, so it has a lid. So we have our lid, it's brass, and our lid comes off. And then here's our compass, you lift these up. And it's, oops. And our compass here, and it's, um, see if I can hold it up and I can actually Bring it closer. There. But at the very top, it's actually made, it was made in France, and there's little a little fleur de lis at the top. Um, so yes, this is our compass made of brass. So that was our show and tell portion of the show, and that is our episode for today. I'm Liz Watson, and thank you for joining me on Voices of the Great War. Until next time.